in the therapeutic world is that it's a confidential service. Exactly. So whatever is behind the closed doors normally stays behind the closed doors. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't it be so interesting (laughs) to hear how couples actually go behind the closed doors? What do they talk about and how they find the whole experience? Welcome to Real Relationships, a real and honest podcast about the inside world of working with close relationships. I'm Alona Serpentine, a couples therapist, a sex therapist, and a relationship educator. Here, I draw the curtain on how close relationships work, interview other relationship professionals, share behind-the-scenes stories from my own practice, and also invite couples, families, and individuals of all kinds to speak about their journey and their real relationships. We as humans cannot live without others. This is why I hope that by sharing the stories and reality-tested information from real professionals and real clients, more people will enjoy fulfilling, supporting, and successful relationships. If you want to have one of those or make your existing ones even better, and I can't imagine you are not, tune in to our episodes released twice a month on Thursdays. And to stay up to date with what we have to share, subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform or join our Facebook group, Real Relationships. Stay tuned and stay real. This is where I'm being interviewed by social media superstar Laura from Sorted Digital Marketing on being a couples therapist and how I came to be one. So yes, I was telling you about why I wanted to do it, the real relationships. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think there is a lot of stuff, a lot of content, a lot of information out there that talks about how to do things, Yeah, you know, how to be a better partner, how to have better sex life, how to communicate more effectively. And Mm -hmm. this is all very important content. Mm -hmm. And I think some people will really benefit from that. But at the same time, I often wonder who is the person who is sharing with me this content? Yeah. You know, are they professionals who work with relationships Mm -hmm. or are they maybe some coaches who have read lots of books and had lots of courses, Mm -hmm. but then maybe haven't really seen a client in real Mm -hmm. life? I mean, I obviously don't want to talk a little bit negatively about it or critically, but I think that side of things. There um, needs to be a, a layer of credibility. Absolutely. And experience and you need to be constantly evolving and yep. you know, educating yourself. 100%. And I think the profession that I'm in, which is the therapeutic profession or the counseling profession, is generally quite a shy profession. Mm-hmm. So most therapists or counselors or psychologists, I think for them it's their worst nightmare <laughs> <laughs> to actually talk about their work mm-hmm. because when clients come to us, there is a certain image that we create. There is a certain frame in which we put ourselves and the way how we conduct things. Mm-hmm. But I think there is another layer to our work which most of our clients don't see. Mm-hmm. And I always think about it how at our practice we what do we do between the sessions yeah and pretty much always it's either writing notes or it's going and looking for your other colleague there to ask them a question or it's literally just thinking I really need to go to the bathroom because my next (laughs) client comes and I only have five minutes and I haven't eaten anything the whole day. Yeah. And then And you need to be prepared for the next client. And you need to be prepared for the next client. But I think it's always interesting how we just leave the room carrying a lot of that information, a lot of the emotion that we just had with clients. But then we're going into the kitchen. It's like, I just need to eat. Yeah. You know, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe what just happened. Mm -hmm. And then we talk. And I think those little insights from behind the scenes, from real practices, from people who actually work with relationships every day, they would be very interesting, probably not only to other professionals. I'm thinking about young novice counselors who are just mm-hmm. starting in that job, but also to clients. Yeah. Because a very big part of my beliefs about how to be a therapist or a counselor is to be yourself. Yeah. So Real Relationships is a very transparent absolutely, podcast where we're pulling back the curtains and showing 
everyone what it's really like. What it's really like exactly to be a person, a professional working with relationships. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking here not just about couples counselors like myself or other counselors. I'm also thinking about anyone else who makes their living by working with relationships, may it be a family therapist, may it be a family lawyer, may it be a mediator, may it be an occupation. Potentially HR. HR yeah. would be an occupational therapist who looks after children with special needs yeah. and then needs to or just simply it's a part of their job to look after their clients, the families and so yeah. on. But also it's not just the professionals. It's also, I really hope that we will be successful in getting this done. It's also inviting the listeners actually into the room mm -hmm. and talking to some of our clients. Because one thing that I think is so unique in the therapeutic world is that it's a confidential service. Exactly. So whatever is behind the closed doors normally stays behind the closed doors. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't it be so interesting <laughs> to hear how couples actually yeah. go behind the closed doors? What do they talk about and how they find the whole experience? I'm sure that's very intriguing for all of the listeners. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. So how did you become a couples counsellor? It's actually a very unusual and maybe slightly quirky story because I never thought I am going to become a couples counsellor. I went into the counselling profession after a 15-year career in international marketing. I have been travelling the world and doing a lot of presentation, preparing lots of marketing materials for in a very different industry, which mm -hmm. is so far away from counselling. But then... I decided that this is probably not enough for me in life and I want to do something more meaningful. Yeah. And a counseling course just popped up when I was looking for things within the helping professions. I always wanted to be a doctor, but I thought, okay, to start the medical career at, in my 30s is going to take me probably 10 years to become a fully qualified doctor. So I thought, no, this is going to be too much time. And I went into counseling because I was, um, I had a teaching degree, which allowed me to fast track the counseling course a little bit. But how I actually became a couples counselor. When I graduated, I went to Europe and on my flight to Europe, I had a conversation with the stewardess mm -hmm. and with a flight attendant. And she asked me what I do for a living. And I said, well, I've just graduated and I'm about to become a therapist. I really want to open my private practice, but I don't really know what to do. For some reason, it's a very long story, but I'm trying to keep it quite short. We talk about astrology and she was very into astrology. <laughs> and she said to me that I have got Mars and Venus very close to each other, whatever that means. <laughs> and they are, I think, in the fourth or fifth house, which is the house of work mm -hmm. or relationships that probably astrologers think that is all completely wrong. But basically <laughs> she said to me, you've got Mars and Venus very close together. Why not couples counseling? And I thought, couples counseling. <laughs> so this came about on a flight. On a flight. <laughs> from to an Zurich. To Zurich. To Zurich right. from Moscow. From flight attendant who was yeah. very into astrology. Wow. That is quite the story. I did not see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I, did, I think lots of my clients are probably now face palming themselves. <laughs> <and thinking. Okay. laughs> so our therapist became a couple's counselor, yes. well, not because of some passionate beliefs about <laughs> relationships and stuff. <laughs> so. No, no. I think the stars were definitely aligned for me. Oh, <laughs> become a yes, counselor. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> what is it like actually being a couples counsellor? Well, when you ask this question, for some reason, I'm thinking about my very first experience when I saw a couple. And I must say, being a couples counsellor is definitely not something that anyone can be ever prepared for. Because when we do most of our counseling education, we're very much in this individual client mindset. We see one person, 
there is one person in the room which is a client and one person in the room who is a therapist and it's all about their relationship Mm -hmm. But when two people come into the room, you quickly start realize that it's very tricky. You have two people, normally they are in somewhat conflict, have slightly different agendas. It's a very good thing when they are on the same page, but there is always a little bit of conflict between them. And you think, okay, and where do I come in? What do I do? Do yeah. I side with one partner or with another or with what? And Being a couples counselor, probably the best metaphor I can describe, it's imagine a car that has two wheels and both of those wheels are out of sync. Like it needs to go to a mechanic, that car. And I'm in a way that mechanic. So when the two, when this car comes to me and I'm trying to align them together and make them work together. Yeah. So you're assessing the problem, finding the tools and hopefully pushing them on their way to fix the tires and align and move in that right direction. Exactly. So sometimes another metaphor that I use, I'm a relationship chiropractor. So I've got more or less of a functioning spine, so to say. Generally, in most cases, unfortunately, sometimes it's not the case. Mm -hmm. And my job is to align that so that everything all the little vertebrae they work together with each other yes so we're moving that scoliosis to a nice nice straight spine that's right i think they just gave me such a nice visual yeah and i'm kind of like pushing it from both sides and it's like yeah. gently as gently as i can yeah and then it's all nicely working and supporting both parts yeah so when do couples actually come and seek help from you so most couples that I see, I would say fall probably in one of the three categories. So the biggest topic that couples want to talk about or the biggest challenge that they're facing is their communication. Mm -hmm. It's not actually always what the real problem is. So very often it's a lack of understanding, lack of maybe intimacy and affection between the partners. It can be also some past emotional challenges that are just inherited from our childhood so yeah. there can be issue with that yeah correct there's a many many clients have a lot of baggage that they may not be even aware of sure. but communication is definitely a very um, big topic that i hear it very often when i ask my couples okay what can i help you with mm -hmm. And then very often they say, we, we're struggling to talk to each other or we're constantly getting into fights or we don't understand each other. So yes, communication is number one. The second big category is trust. Mm -hmm. It's when something happened within the relationship that caused one or both partners lose their trust in each other or in the relationship. And often those couples had some what I call an emo emotional injuries. It can be very often it's a sexual affair or any affair, or it can be just feeling abandoned. Let's say when a young mother doesn't feel supported by, by her partner and she feels completely alone, so unsupported by the partner that she feels like, okay, how can I trust you if you're not there for me? So it's the second big category. And probably the third big category, it's all about we've lost that spark. Yeah. We're good, but it just feels like we're in a rut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the most interesting categories because it's actually a lot about what people don't say or what they don't do that gets them into that situation. Yeah. I, I guess it's probably not fully expressing. Very often. And unfortunately, when people come in that third category that we've lost the spark or we're in a rut this is probably the most challenging one yeah because often it's too late but I, yeah. i'm so i'm going to stay very positive but yeah. at the same time i need to say that better sooner than later yeah so being a couples counselor i'm sure there's a lot of challenges however what is the most rewarding part of the job Well, of course, the most rewarding part of the job is to see two people just really showing their love and affection for each other. That's to see that and, and actually have the privilege to hear some of the most intimate stories. 
but also to sh- to see the vulnerability from both partners and the way how many many couples actually that come to couples counseling they have so much love and affection and admiration for each other i think that's the most rewarding part is when you are invited mm-hmm. into this very very intimate space mm. and often i always try to downplay it when clients say oh thank you so much that you helped us to reconnect and find ourselves again i always try to say okay yes maybe i helped you i helped you to rediscover it but it's 100% yours yeah it's not something that i can give to a couple yeah it's something that they need to have yeah. already and i think that's probably the most rewarding part when i can just see that real love and affection that i think unfortunately often in the culture where i live is very well hidden people are not i don't find many couples are to be expressive with their affection and with their love for each other but it's definitely there especially mm-hmm. in behind closed doors i think it's uh, yeah. it's real it must be a pretty cool experience getting to see couples in that vulnerable state absolutely absolutely and it's a huge privilege yeah So you're obviously a couples counsellor, but you're also a sex therapist. So what does that, what does that mean? What is a sex therapist? So a sex therapist is basically another um, therapeutic professional. It's a therapist, it's a counsellor who knows how to work with specific sexual issues. Very often couples counsellors do not have any education or any specific tools how to help couples with their sexuality and specific physical needs and a sex therapist is a person who can have those open conversations and normally this person is educated so there are specialist courses for example at the university of sydney where you can uh, train to become a sex therapist so basically a sex therapist is a is a therapist who knows how to talk about sex, who knows how to ask the right questions, and also can provide specific tools, specific interventions, how a couple can strengthen their sexual life. It's very important to differentiate the sex therapist from, let's say, a sexual surrogate. So a sex therapist is definitely not a person who is going to engage in sex with the clients. There are professionals, they're called uh, surrogate partners who do that. And that's part of the, it's it's actually not a very big part of their work, but it, it is something that they do. A sex therapist typically might invite such a sex, a sexual surrogate partner to work together with a client or maybe even with a couple. Mm-hmm. But the sex therapist is basically in a nutshell, think of a counselor, think of a normal therapist, maybe even think of a psychologist who just knows how to work with specific sexual issues. Yes, because in relationships, sex is a huge part. And I think it's often still to this day quite taboo and hush-hush and you don't really talk about it. But in your experience as a couples counselor, how often does that play into why they're there or contributing to their struggles? I think it's a really, really good question. And you just hit the nail on its head as well, Laura. It is something that pretty much all couples, I would say, I mean, all maybe is a little bit too much, but I would say many, many couples really would like to get a bit more help in this area because we do suffer from lack of communication about sex. It is culturally not quite acceptable to be very open with your partner about your sexual needs. And unfortunately, the less you talk about sex, less quality sex you have. That's a very simple formula. Right. If you want to have better sex, you need to be better at talking about sex. Mm-hmm. And in my experience, which is quite interesting, once I finished my um, psychosexual degree and I started mentioning to my clients that I'm a sex therapist, I was always like, oh, we, we really want to talk about this. Like at some point, I really would like to talk about mm-hmm. our intimacy. Yeah. It was really interesting how many of them would just jump on that invitation to talk about their intima- intimacy. 
So in my experience, a lot of couples will benefit from talking about sex more openly and they don't need to go and see a sex therapist for that. You know, just have very honest, open conversations with each other on a couch in a very safe and, and, and quiet space. And that can already help a lot. Mm-hmm. Another thing that I want to mention about sex therapy is that um, we normally work in conjunction with other professionals, especially if it's about sexual dysfunctions or variations in sexual functioning. Yeah. Uh, for example, we're talking about erectile dysfunctions or maybe vaginismus. So it's a very unfortunately common condition. Um, we would be working with a GP or, or maybe with a gynecologist yeah. or a pelvic floor physio to work on those things. Yeah. So, so you're working in conjunction with other health professionals to all work together for the common goal. Absolutely, absolutely. And and, and a good thing is that we have we're able to help our clients um through this integrative approach, which means we're not just trying to talk about things. Mm-hmm. We can also do things yeah. to help. Making that real impact. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I find it a very, very interesting and something that I would like to talk more about that specific area of work as well. Mm -hmm. Would be nice to have a sex therapist actually already have one in mind who, who has been working in this industry for, I think, over 20 years. It would be great to talk to him. But in terms of the next episodes, what's to come? The next episode is going to be actually with a person from the opposite end of the spectrum, me being a person working with couples staying together. And I want to talk to a person who talks to couples who separate. And the reason I want to do it this way, because couples counseling, it's definitely not about keeping people together. It's Mm -hmm. about guiding them to where they want to be, what works best for them. And I think it's really important even for couples who may basically it's very important for couples to know that even when you separate there are professionals who can support you through this process because very often the separation is much much more challenging for couples than staying in the relationship it's a very critical crisis moment yeah and there are professionals who specialize specifically in that even for me when i came to counseling i didn't know that there were people who do that yeah who help couples to go through that so that's going to be our next episode talking Amazing. to a professional who helps couples separate wow very interesting i'm looking forward to tuning in for that one thank you laura and that's a wrap Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Real Relationships Podcast. For more reality tested relationship information, visit our Facebook group, Real Relationships. Or if you have a question or a guest suggestion for me to interview next, email me at podcast at Stay tuned and stay real.